Good morning, everybody. Welcome to True North Online this morning. Uh, typically this summer, we have been traveling around outdoors, showing you little bits of our community. Uh, but as you probably, I don't know what the weather's like today on Sunday, but today is Friday. Uh, and if you remember, two days ago on Friday, it was a little wet and rainy, uh, and I'm getting misted on at the moment. So I won't be going outdoors. Uh, I will find another place inside uh, to record this morning. But I thought I'll show you off the hill and the cloud and the fog uh, for the announcements this morning. So uh, this morning, I just wanted to give you a quick update to our reopening, uh, the, the sanctuary. So we will be opening the sanctuary in two weeks uh, for those who want to come and join us in person. We are working through still what that will look like. Uh, the deacons board met this week to walk through a plan for how to have people come and worship safely. Uh, and so we're piecing that together, putting that uh, together, and that will be out in the next a uh, couple of weeks and so be watching for that. We are excited to be back together again in worship, uh, but we know that that is not viable for everyone. We know that that may not be comfortable for everyone. And so uh, for those who are enjoying and like the online format, that will still continue. Uh, we won't be able to have that be live in the morning alongside of the the worship service happening on site, but we will record it and upload it and have it as uh, a premiere later in that day for people to gather and watch and worship together. Also as part of the fall opening, one of the things that we are working through is children's ministry. Now typically at True North on Sunday morning, we have children's ministry during our second service. Uh, for children up to grade five. We are not going to start that right away on step September 6th with everything else. Uh, we are inviting families to come and sit together in the sanctuary uh, to worship together. It will be a shortened service uh, and a little more interactive for kids. So we are gonna do online children's ministry. Uh, and so we're gonna take the lessons that we've been learning and working through the last few years and we've turned those into online lessons. Now, in order to make that awesome and fantastic, we're also gonna be giving out homemade or take home packets uh, for every family and every kid to be able to take home and be able to watch these videos online and have the supplies to do crafts and activity pages and all of those things that will be needed, even a few little family activities to do together will be in that take home pack. To take part in that, we are asking that you sign up. So if you go to our Facebook, actually if you click the link that's in the description here, you can find that uh, sign up sheet. We need that to happen as soon as possible so that we can get those put together uh, to, be, to go home for families. We are excited for this. I think it'll be great, uh, but that is just one of the things that's coming up for this fall for that. So, uh, I think that's all of our announcements for this week. Uh, so, I'm going to go find a place to do the sermon this morning, and so I will see you in a couple of seconds. Well, here we are. This summer, we've been looking at the life of Jesus as written uh, by Mark. And I, for one, have been loving and enjoying going through this passage and this study uh, and looking back over the life of Jesus. And as I kind of said last time when I preached, looking at how Jesus treated uh, the religious, how uh, he would stop them and cause them to rethink what did they believe? What were they doing? Why were they doing what they were doing? And he often frustrated them and got them got under their skin uh, to the point that where we're looking today is time and time again through chapter 11 and 12, you see the religious leaders coming alongside and going, it says they started looking for a way to kill him, 
him. They started finding ways to try to trick him and turn the crowd against him and, and take Jesus down. And uh, that's what's happening in, in what we're going to look at today, chapter 12. Last week, Mike looked at chapter 9 and the disciples came to Jesus and said, why couldn't we do that? We should be able to. And Jesus said, it took a little more. That took my work. And so uh, in today's passage, we're looking at chapter 12. Now, since chapter 9, uh, the Jesus has entered into Jerusalem, the holy city, uh, the place where all of Israel was going to celebrate the Passover, to recognize what God had done in saving them uh, in the past. And all of Israel is coming. And so Jesus is there. The religious leaders are taking this opportunity to kind of corner him in crowds and to really drill him and ask him questions time and time again. And so in chapter 11 and 12, he's they're asking him all kinds of things about what is the end times going to be like? What about divorce? Is that allowed to happen? Uh, what what about paying taxes? We don't have to do that, do we? Like, um, And one of the scribes, who would have been a lawyer, comes up to Jesus, who knows the Old Testament. He knows all the laws and all the rules. Chapter 12, verse 28. One of the scribes approached Jesus. He had heard all the debating going on with Jesus and the other religious leaders, and he saw that Jesus was answering them well. And so he said to Jesus, okay, Jesus, which command is the most important of all? And I think if you've been around church any length of time, you will know the answer to this. But Jesus answers very simply and says, the most important is listen, O Israel. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Now, at this point, everyone would kind of have to be going, yeah, okay, right, good job, you gave the most Sunday school answer ever. Because that passage of scripture is straight out of Deuteronomy. Uh, It's what the Israelite people, the Jewish people called the Shema. It is something that was taught to them as children. It is something that as adults you recited twice daily as a reminder to love God, as a reminder that everything you do is to love God. Everything you believe, every every action needs to be to love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's ingrained in them. It's written around them. It's Uh, recited to them time and time again. So it's like the Sunday school answer of, well, okay, sure. And so there's no debating that, that people would have just been like, okay, Jesus grew up as a Jewish person. Good for him. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Jesus, and Jesus doesn't even allow like a breath and somebody to poke in and say, well, yeah, Mark shows Jesus immediately goes to his next sentence. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. And this second part is where Jesus would have been showing off a little bit to the religious leaders, to the scribes, uh, to the people around, because that love your neighbor as yourself is a very little lesser known passage uh, out of Leviticus uh, that is just one in a string of a bunch of rules, a bunch of laws that is just kind of thrown in there. Even in uh, our the way we mark up the Bible now, it's not even its own verse. It's tagged in with other stuff. It's this few little words that are thrown in there. Um, and so the scribe would have gone, okay, he does know his, his, his stuff. He knows who, he knows the law. And so what we can deduce from this, I think, and actually from my study and what I've read and understand, Jesus isn't just throwing this in here to, to show the scribe that, don't worry, I know the law. I know what the important, what the commands are. I know what we need to be doing. He's also throwing this in here to say, listen, the first greatest commandment, yes, is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is just like it. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other command greater than these. Jesus is saying here, loving the Lord your God and loving your neighbor as yourself need to be together. Without missing a beat, he says that second command. He's saying the love, loving God cannot exist without loving your neighbor. You have to have the two of them together. You see, as I preached earlier a couple weeks ago, the religious leaders would often come up with other rules and guidelines, rituals, laws that would allow some to show their love to God while oppressing, hurting, uh, while ignoring their neighbor. Jesus, in, in doing this, wants to ensure that his first command of love God being the most important, that the religious leaders, that the Israelites don't twist that to mean, I need to love God, which means I can't love my neighbor. Because by loving my neighbor, I might be supporting something that's not godly. By loving my neighbor, I'm, I'm not loving God because I'm violating God's law by loving someone who doesn't love God, maybe. I'm, I'm violating God's law by loving someone who acts differently than I do, who believes differently than I do, who doesn't uh, follow the same rules that I do, and I can't love them. And so I can't love them because that would mean I'm not loving God. But Jesus ties these two together. In doing that, he's saying you have to love your neighbor in order to love God. Loving God cannot mean that we compromise on loving his creation, his people. For so long, the Israelites would quote and focus on the Shema, the first greatest command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus brought this back to attention by claiming that loving God without loving your neighbor isn't loving God at all. Now, I mentioned that uh, that loving your neighbor as yourself is from Leviticus. It is one of their laws that they were to follow. And it was just kind of thrown in there at the end of a whole list of other rules about how do you love your neighbor? How do you look out for people who are near you? I'm not going to go through all of them. You can open Leviticus 19 verse 9 to 18 if you want to read through that. But it was simple stuff. Some stuff like when you're harvesting a field or a vineyard, don't harvest everything. Leave some there for your neighbors, for those who can't afford, who need that food. Leave some there. That's showing them love. There's things like simply like don't steal or pay your workers a livable wage. Don't hinder those with disability. It specifically talks about the blind and uh, those who you don't put a stumbling block in front of those who, uh, who can't walk. It talks about seeking justice for those who are in the court system and not siding with those who have money just because they have money. It talks about if your neighbor is being threatened to stand up for them, to help them. It says, talks about not seeking revenge on someone who harms you. Don't hold a grudge against your neighbor. Talks about forgiving those who have hurt you. Loving your neighbor is more than just looking out for them, loaning them a cup of sugar, giving them cookies or inviting them over for coffee. It's more than bringing them gifts or when something bad happens in their family, helping them out. It's more than loaning them something when they're in need. Loving your neighbor, as to Leviticus, as to many other passages throughout Scripture, means sacrificing for them. Sacrificing things, sacrificing reputation in your community or even in your church. Sacrificing your own wants and desires and what you think 
is best for them in order to show them love. Now, where do I get this idea? Well, number one, it came from that Leviticus list. All of those things had to do with sacrificing your betterment for them or sacrificing your reputation for them. But also in Mark chapter 12, verse 34, no, sorry, verse 32 and onward, the, the scribe repeats back to Jesus and says, yes, you are right. These are the greatest commands. And in verse 33, it says, and to love God with all your heart, your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. To love God and to love your neighbor is far more important than all of the rules and the religious rituals that we have to follow in order to become close to God. And when Jesus heard this man's answer, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. The religious things that had built up, that had been taught, the going to church on Sunday, the uh, reciting scriptures, the rules that the religious leaders had put into place were not what brought you closer, the scribe, closer to the kingdom of God. It was recognizing and realizing that loving God, loving people, loving who God created him to be, loving self, brought you closer to the kingdom of God. You are not far from the kingdom of God, Jesus says. What is it that maybe you have to give up, that you have to sacrifice to love your neighbor, to love God? What is it that's holding you back from showing love to people around you? In the Luke version of this, it goes in, Jesus then bumps right into the story of the Good Samaritan and who was a neighbor. It wasn't the priest. It wasn't the religious person. It was the scum of the community, the one who showed and looked after and cared for and sacrificed money and sacrificed reputation in the community to help someone who was hurting, to help someone who was oppressed, to stand for justice. May we recognize and realize that to become close to the kingdom of God is to show love, to sacrifice our own wants and desires, sometimes our own religious wants and desires, to seek justice, to love people, because God has created them. And yes, to love God. Father God, we ask this morning that you would speak to us, that you would show us who it is that you are calling us to love. Lord God, that you would show in our hearts the things it is that we are holding on to that are preventing us from loving you more. Maybe there's something in our life that we don't want to give up. Lord God, help us to be able to love you with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. But Lord God, the harder command, help us to love people around us. Help us to love and show your love because we know that that is what you call us to do. Lord God, help us to sacrifice our own desires, our own wants, so that others may feel comfortable so others may feel your love, know who you are. In your name, amen. Sometimes I think it's easy to say, love God, love others. But that command is much harder to live out because it means sacrificing maybe sometimes who we are, what we want.
what we think is best for ourselves. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, again, keep an eye out in the next few weeks for what church will look like for True North in the coming months. Uh, and I will see you in a couple of weeks.